Good afternoon, everyone. A renewable energies building. We're going to hemp a house right here in East Tennessee. And the process goes like this. Dump in your dried hemp fiber. Premix to get any extra debris out. Add in a treated volcanic ash as a catalyst. Add water. Get the perfect consistency. Frame up the walls. Got to leave the space in between to drop. The moistened hemp fiber making the mold. Once in, tamp. Layer by layer. Moving on up. Remember the windows. Pre-frame those and the same. Finish walls, fire resistant, perfect temperature control, humidity control. Remove the framing, move it up, and start the next layer. You're going to end up with the corners, but you're going to put an outer coating on top of that. Let this dry for a couple months, and then you're going to wrap it again. Heating is a thing of the past, along with cooling. Any form, any shape, anywhere. This is the future of building materials moving forward. Let's look at the process. And as we go through, please remember I am at a construction site. We're going to call this a hemp cast, I guess, where we're going to talk about the process. And I'm going to roll some video for you so you can see overlaid what we're talking about in real time at the site and how others that are pros at it explain it. So I hope you enjoy this one. A little bit different format, but so important to bring it to it. There are so many options now with our supply chains falling apart and the non-stability of our grids anymore. One of these will absolutely get you through the apocalypse. So let's take a look at it. Hey, and since I live about an hour from Haven Earth, Paul River Richardson, master plan architect and hemp builder, invited me down and said, hey, we got a project going on right now. We're going to hemp the walls. See what we have going on. Maybe you'll want to build one of these on your farm too. So, of course, I took up the offer. Uh, like I said, even though it looks low tech, what we're really doing is we're creating a, a high performance building envelope. Like, since the Industrial Revolution, we started building with, uh, with one thing in mind, to keep moisture and vapor out of our indoor environment. And uh, what we're starting to realize is that eventually Mother Nature prevails and water gets into the walls. And then once that water can't get out, it mixes with all these toxic building materials and, and starts to mold and creates a really unhealthy indoor air environment. Uh, but when we build with a, a material like this that's vapor open, we're working with the elements. Um, so with hempcrete, I'm sure they've mentioned how porous the herd is. Um, and that combined with the cementitious binder, um, it, it brings together a whole slew of properties that create a really good air environment. Um, so. It has a, a thermal resistance value uh, as well as a thermal mass value. So it has like a, a volumetric heat capacity similar to brick. So it's going to collect heat or cool all throughout the day and night. And then it has a phase shift time of about 12 and a half hours. So as, as, it, as it cools down at night, it's going to release that heat from the day and keep your indoor air environment really temperate. Um, and then with the humidity, it has a moisture buffer value that can keep the indoor humidity around 40 to 50 percent RH, uh, even if it's 80 percent humidity outside. So, building with uh, envelopes like this is super beneficial not only for the the resident but the community. Um, so, like on my farm, I grew 40 acres this year. I was selected as a, a national pilot farm for a paper and plastics company. So we built a little decorticator and we separated all of our fiber and sold it to these guys. And now I have enough, uh, enough herd left over on my farm for about four or, five four or five houses this size. Now that Trump will return to the White House, it's time to consider your retirement and portfolio. The Wall Street Journal said gold will outperform stocks in 2025 as Trump threatened BRICS countries with 100% tariffs as they move away from the U.S. dollar. Since 2022, gold has surged 40% after the U.S. seized Russia's assets. That was a wake-up call for central banks around the globe to diversify their reserves away from the dollar and into gold. Now Goldman Sachs warning the S&P will generate paltry returns over the next decade. At the same time, Goldman Sachs said Trump's presidency will light a fire under gold, pushing it to $3,150 an ounce. The threat of stagflation, our national debt, tariffs, and global de-dollarization will ignite gold prices. Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. 
And the Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver. No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Give them a call, 888-546-7020 for your free investor guide today. And remember, Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated IRA gold dealer for the seventh year in a row. That's 888-546-7020. Um, so, okay. yeah, that's that's what our goal is right now is to start to put that into houses up in Michigan. Um, yeah, it's cold up there. That'd be a perfect place. You know, Tennessee's pretty temperate anyway. Even in the yeah. winter, you might get a few 20 degree nights. Yeah. You know, except for last year, it got into the single digits. But right. otherwise, you know, you're going to get 20s in the evenings in the in the uh, winter, but only for, you know, two months max and mm -hmm. not every night. So, right. you know, Michigan is freaking cold up there. Every I went. To yeah. Ohio State, and I, you know, yeah, where it's cold up in that oh, old yeah. Michigan, Ohio area. Damn, yeah. that winter is just a brutal up yeah, there. Yeah, fall and winter, you'll be, you'll be blasting your heat in the morning, and then turn on your AC in the in the night with the in your truck, because it is definitely very big temperature swings. But, um, yeah, I yeah, but just that ambient temperature of always in the 20s for like months on end. Oh know? yeah, oh yeah, and then not just a smidgen of time where it dips there, but yeah, that's your constant working temperature. So to insulate something like this versus natural, you know, those synthetic fibers that we're using. Yeah, yeah, and all petroleum-based products. Yeah, where does that go though? So my question is, okay, everybody's talking about recycling. Like the solar panels, you can't recycle those. The silver's lost. That's another thing for silver buffs out there. You can't reclaim that silver. Yeah. Where does all that go? Yeah, exactly. That all goes into a landfill, and it's just going to break down, erode, and all those you know chemicals are coming out. Yeah. Uh, have metals too. So fiberglass, where does it go? Yeah, and it's fascinating because we've only been building that way for like 80, 90 years. Like since like the 20s and 30s, when we started using all these like cyan cyanurate foams and all this stuff, and now we don't even know how long they last. And typically, you got to renovate or remodel your house within 40 years, you know. And this stuff. There's definitely a difference when you're building with intention for it to be a long lasting second skin. You know, like these homes that we're living in, that's like our, our second skin. So we're putting toxic chemicals all around us. It definitely it plays a it plays a role in the long term. Like I'm working with a nonprofit in Michigan called the Canary Homes Initiative. It's basically trying to build homes for people who are on disability due to immunocompromisation. So like they have conditions that make them really sensitive to VOCs, mold, uh, even EMFs. And so they're, they're calling these people the canaries in the coal mine because they're starting to be affected by the generational living in toxic boxes that we build around us. And uh, so they need natural built homes with, with straw, clay, rammed earth, hemp, and stuff that's like more conducive to a healthy indoor air environment, you know. So that's where my first house is going. I'm building that tiny house on a trailer uh, this winter and shipping it up to Grand Rapids, Michigan. But I'm building it down here with the river. I'm wondering what the time is. Like 40 years to remodel a home compared to, let's say, in the 1800s, what was the remodel time? Right, right. Everything was natural back then. It was like, even in my house, at the top there, has this blown paper in the top. Blown cellulose, yeah. Yeah. And you see them in, in towns, the historic homes built in the 1800s. None of the pink, you know, panther stuff in my place. It's all just <laughs> newbie way to say it. it was like blown newspaper or blown cellulose. A little borax salt to keep it fire resistant. Yeah. yeah, but it's starting to come apart and flake and get really, you can sweep it up now with a, with a shop vac and mm -hmm. thing. It's, it's like, out. we're going to put something else in, but I don't want to put fiber up there because that's just going to be raining down on us all the time. And you can put this in a roof with a different mix so you can mix different densities so if we were doing a floor like typically we're gonna mix for these walls one part herd one and a half parts binder but if you were doing a floor you want more thermal mass more density you go maybe a one-to-one -one, uh, with your binder and herd and if you're doing a roof where you want more insulation value to meet a R32 or R39 whatever your code is you'll put a lot more herd maybe two parts herd one part binder and then you'd pack it a lot less so combining with the tight packed outsides, we're, we're, we're getting that thermal mass similar to a brick. And then on the inside, we're leaving it fluffier for that. So that's why I, I Yeah, like... the density of it would be thermal you know, insulation, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah, because like the more binder we put in, the more close it is to an ICF or a cinder block home, you know, yeah. where it's all brick. And, and so when we're building for different climates, that's something to consider as well. I probably want denser packed walls because then I'll have a better uh, thermal mass, you know, so when it's sunny during the day, it'll warm it up during the night. You know, versus here, you said it's more temperate. We just want to resist temperature change from outside to inside. It looks low tech, but it's really high performing, you know. 
Because, like, talk about sides of the homes for a second, because that's south-facing wall over there. We've got north-facing wall here, so. Yeah. Drying time or, like, capabilities, too, because this one's going to be, this will be a much colder face of the house. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what their wind pattern is, but anybody can follow the sun, right? Yeah. But what happens out here compared to what happens over there in terms of even heating or even dispersion of heat or cool through the day? Yeah, no, and, and then we got, on this side, we got the tallest temperature structure is 11 foot over there, and then wide open glass windows to, to get that solar gain coming into the house. And then uh, this wall, like you said, will keep it cool um, during the day, and at night, it'll collect heat and disperse it during the, during the night to keep it warmer. A little bit of a temperature swings at night. Like it's pretty chilly, you know, 50s, 40s. Well, it's more extreme than it usually is. I must say that it would be about 15 degrees. Now, somewhere it's like 30, 40 degree shift. It's yeah. unreal, because that's my specialty. That's what I do with my with my science, is study solar activity and the cycles of it and how it reduces or increases food production mm. and the way our civilization moves on that food production through time and why we come to the apex of civilizations and the collapses of them. And you can see it on the cycle, but that matches the solar activity it cycle solar too. Activity. It's really interesting to see how this is coming at this time then, how hemp is coming along because we can produce food, shelter, and fuel. Both, you know, yeah. off, off, the, off the grain, we can get a high protein, balanced omega uh, food additive. I eat hemp parts all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it's also actually amazing to see how maybe that can help us through that, that time of a solar shift. Well, that's why crops can't grow. And not only that, but the moisture patterns change and then the, the, more, yeah, the heat. Mm -hmm. However much heat is there in the day, like how much yeah, watts per meter squared is striking the surface of that decreases mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the point that those the photosynthesis decreases and then that you, that's not that's fine, but you're just like what comes on the heads of the plants at the end of the year that's going to decrease by twenty percent. Wow. wow. Or the protein content shifts, or the starch content shifts, or the actual kernel mass or mm -hmm. seed mass shifts down. And you're talking about millions of acres and you're talking about millions of people not getting fed tens of millions of bushels or 100 million bushels less okay so then systems start to tweak on themselves and start to break down this is just a historical lesson in the last six times of this yeah so the economy will get hit first because food gets really expensive people spend more on food yeah. um, the opportunities dry up because the, the economy is shifting so people start to move and you see a lot of population migration the economy shifts mm. And then uh, there's always a shift in governance, too, because the government needs to shift the way it governs over citizens because they've seen through the illusion. And I don't know what it is. It's something electromagnetic that our brains process information differently. So if this is the whole reason I'm telling you this. So systems break down during this time routinely. Like what was stable completely breaks down and people move to better pastures, for a better term, the 1600, 1200, 800 AD. Right. Well, if our systems break down, you can still grow hemp and you can still produce your own crop on your own land and you can still have a viable building material provided you could chop it. So, you know, thinking in terms of system breakdown too, like what gains or opportunities are there to produce your own locally, to have your own building material that's of way superior quality. And I'll be bringing you part two as we moved in to have lunch. Roundtable conversation. If you're interested in more Haven Earth, links in the description box below. Reach out to River. I'll be happy to discuss with you how this is a viable building material and the future. Also, check us out on TikTok forward slash at Civilization Cycle. Thoughts for the future, one minute at a time. I appreciate you spending your valuable time. Hope you got something out of the video. And see you next time. Bye for now.